comments at the end. If you have any questions or comments at the end um, and you don't wish to be recorded, please feel free to type it in the text box. But um, anyway, my name is Louisa Uliet, and I'm curator of talks and events here at the Photographer's Gallery. And I'm delighted to be here this evening with Kimberly Lamb. Uh, Kimberly Lamb is going to give us some context and background on uh, Deborah Turgeville and going, giving more insight, I suppose, into some of the, oh, hello, Dora, uh, giving some more background into some of the aspects of hyperfemininity, how it relates to feminism, and some scholarship around how we can think, uh, how we can unpack those notions of um, hyperfemininity. Um, so, uh, Kimberly is Associate Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, and Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University. Her research brings together Anglo Anglophone literature, visual culture, and psychoanalytic feminism. She has authored um, numerous books, including Addressing the Other Woman, Textual Correspondence of Feminist Art and Writing, and there's also a forthcoming book looking at Laura Mulvey and Peter Wallen's Feminist Avant-Garde. Um, she has a particular interest in aesthetic practices, such as fashion, that challenges the devaluation of femininity. So in terms of the event for this evening, we'll be here roughly for about 45, 50 minutes. Um, Kimberly will give a presentation, and um, do feel free, as I mentioned, to put any questions or comments in the chat box. At the end of her presentation, we'll pick up some questions from there, but if you wish to pose your question or make your comment directly to us, please feel free to come on um, camera and pose it directly to Kimberly or myself. If you are in London, I do hope you will have a chance to visit the Deborah Turberville exhibition, which is open until the end of February. And without further ado, here is Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Um, can you can you hear me? Um, thanks for being here. Um, thanks for this really nice invitation. Um, for those of you who are in London, um, I'm so jealous. I wish I could uh, see this exhibition, um, but I'm excited to be part of it in this in in this way. Um, I'm just a, a real fan of, of Tuber Bill's work, and I and I think it's just really rich and and fascinating. So let me share my screen, and I will get started here. So we did all this before, and now, <laughs> um, this see. always happens. Yeah. Um, um, can you see the? Let me um, let me put it into slides. So, can you see those? Or um, yeah, and you're in the corner. Now. Okay, great, great. Um, uh, though she made a living in fashion photography and contributed uh, substantially to it, uh, Deborah Tuberville often declared that she was not a fashion photographer. Uh, there's no doubt, as the exhibition photo collage shows, that her work uh, defies this, the crisp and glossy images associated with the, the genre um, of fashion photography. But rather than eschew the category, uh, I want to argue that uh, Tuberville's photographs are meta-reflections on fashion photography. That is, her images are about uh, fashion photographs. Um, they create spaces for thinking about what fashion and images have traditionally meant for women, justifying and reinforcing the idea that their bodies as commodities, and this is something that we can talk about, are kind of the perfect props for uh, uh, commodities, and particularly fashion commodities. These spaces, which I do read as, as feminist, offer more than critique. They allow us to imagine what photography could be at the level of the psyche, but also at the level of, of culture. For the most part, uh, um, fashion, femininity, fashion, and images are perceived to be kind of a one dimensional. Um, and, when they, but, and when they come together, uh, presumptions about their simplicity and their superficiality um, get reinforced. Uh, to my mind, to my eye, uh, Tuberville's images kind of burrow into these assumptions, um, but they also kind of blow them apart by suggesting that there is a dark complexity to femininity that resists its full visualization. 
Um, and so what in what follows, I, I argue that her images create spaces for women's homoerotic fantasies um, and attest to the dangers of allowing women who identify as feminine to be subjects of their own erotic complexity. Um, my reading of Tuberville's photographs have been uh, informed by this essay called Playing with Dolls by the contemporary artist Sylvia Kobowski. Playing with dolls is a, is a psychoanalytic reflection on the complexity of identification, uh, particularly when it comes to images. Um, Kobowski exposes the habit in, in, in feminist scholarship on visual culture to rely on the idea that the female spectator is a passive masochistic statistic. This, ha this habit is particularly pronounced when it comes to fashion photography. Um, beginning with her own memory of flipping through a fashion magazine before going into a gynecological exam, uh, Kobowski argues that this reliance on passivity skips over the activity of looking and blocks out a layered understanding of subjectivity, one that is shaped by, as Kobowski ex explains, factors, events, and processes, meanings that are never grasp graspable in isolation. One of these processes is, is identification, and Kopowski draws on the work of the feminist philosopher Luce Rigori, who describes um, uh, who describes the forms of identification that are possible when girls play with dolls. And I'm and I'm taking in a kind of an expanded idea of girls playing with dolls here, um, and linking it to to fashion. Whereas Sigmund Freud uh, relies upon a dualistic logic where only active or passive positions are available, a rigorized formulations allow us to see identification as an unpredictable process that is never exclusively active or passive, but can be re uh, represented through what uh, Kobowski calls metaphors of layering, simultaneity, fluctuation, and nonlinear den density. In other words, women can see the idealized images fashion photography has traditionally utilized um, uh, to co consolidate its powers, to objectify the visual appearance of women's bodies, flatten them into one definition, but their identification with those images probably cannot be reduced to the binary of passive acceptance or active resistance. Um, and I see this relay between passivity and activity really important for what Tuberville is doing with fashion photography. Um, such reductive interpretations, um, you know, that that women are either you know passively accepting or actively resisting, um, re um, uh, impede us from seeing the aesthetic texture of differentiated subjectivity, and also keep it, this also keeps kind of the vulnerability of passive acceptance feminized, and then therefore linked to uh, women and, and their bodies. So I take I take as my starting point this image, which I have up uh, on the screen, um, and and I think it's one of the images uh, by which uh, Tuberville is best best known. It's from the bathhouse sequence that she took in New York City's uh, Astor Levy public bathhouse for American Vogue in 1975. In these haunted photographs, uh, lit, lit by domed skylights, models in bathing suits are arranged in seductive poses. Though the bodies of the models are physically proximate to each other and do suggest some kind of intimacy, the arrangements of their bodies rhyme with each other. They all kind of contribute to this a, a, a sort of somber, puzzling, maybe even depressed sort of mood. They're also isolated and disconnected from each other. Polly Mellon, the art director at Vogue at the time, tells us that Tuberville spoke to each model individually about the image she wanted to create. And we can see that each woman composes herself into an image that suggests a kind of sculptural opacity, even an inaccessible privacy, and seems to be in her own subjective world, which makes the poses perhaps melancholic performances of fashion standard visual grammar. In this image, the most emblematic of the series, the white woman with the bathing cap in the center um, Takes up the uh, uh, takes up the most space with a kind of athletic display of her body that feels strangely overdetermined. 
Uh, with her open legs placed par far from her torso and her arms stretched up vertically to the ceiling, she is the figure who announces most explicitly, I think, the photograph's distance from the pleasing, easy to consume beauty we expect of, of fashion photographs. With her strange pose, uh, while her strange pose shows off the bathing suit described in the copy as a milieu for the best bodies, the most liter liberated beaches, the woman's pubic area is startlingly and unabashedly present, uh, accented by the, by the taut muscles of her upper thigh. The wide V made by her spread legs draws our eyes to the water on the tiled floor, which adds a shadowy, shiny, and messy physicality to the shot. The other models with their more languid, less graphic poses have been arranged to kind of orbit around this central figure. The two women standing uh, present some of fashion's familiar repertoire of poses that contrasts with the sharp lines the woman in the center creates with her bodies. The black woman um, on, the, on the right stands at the bathhouse wall near, near the silver shower faucets with her head turned. The elongated view of her backside and the curves of her legs and buttocks uh, is, um, is complicated by the fact that she's looking directly into the camera with, with, with what could be fear, suspicion, resistance, all of which mediate our visual access um, to the image of her body. The tall white woman um, with the blonde bob um, leans into a structure that demarcates the shower, shower area with a bent elbow. Her contrapposto pose draws attention to her thin arms and the sharp knob of her, of her hip, bones, hip bone. The two women closer to the floor embody a kind of sadness that is not a regular feature of fashion photography. Um, the woman against the back wall wearing white makeup and wrapped in a white gauze looks like a sculpture from the classical world and her hand is placed expressively and perhaps despairingly on her forehead. The woman in the front center of the image wearing a loose fitting Terry poncho performs a rag doll like dead deadness, her head below the faucet, below a faucet and one arm listlessly falling between her legs. As I see it, Tuberville's arrangement of these poses, along with her masterful use of light and shadow, makes the image into a museum of forgotten sculptures that refuse the demand to fill the image with effective presence um, and transmit it to viewers. That the work of femininity that that fashion that the fashion industry relies upon and often exploits. And I in in my work I've been describing this as the affective labor of the image, the the work ex, uh, expected of often expected of women to kind of transmit um, comforting uh, feelings um, that uh, often arise from their uh, beauty or kind of creating a, a pleasing image. Um, in her book, uh, in the book, Fash The Fashion uh, Photographs, Tuberville tells the story of how the series came to be. Alexandra Lieberman, the editorial director at Condé Nast, asked her to do 10 pages of bathing suits and her encouraged her to make the images remarkable. The bathhouse was the scene that she chose for the project of making remarkable images. And this was at, this was kind of uh, decided um, spontaneously or, or on the fly because a planned trip to Peru was canceled um, because of the military coup, the military coup there. She, um, uh, Tuberville describes being drawn to bathhouses, particularly those that are old, run down and dilapidated. A friend knew of one on 23rd, 23rd Street in Manhattan that was built in the, in the early 1900s. Um, and then from there, Tuberville explains how the images took shape. As she writes, and I'll read what's on the screen. Something in the atmosphere began to dictate the pictures. As the sitting progressed, they became increasingly uh, surreal, bizarre, Marquis de Sade in feeling, particularly the black and white images. Each photograph took almost a whole day to work out. Maybe it was the dome skylights with the heavy panes or the eerie daylight that sifted through them or the extreme stark white makeup. Girls in bathing suits normally look a little more healthy. It all seemed a little sinister, like the women were somehow trapped, isolated. Why were they there? What, are they do what were they doing? Staring straight ahead, lost in their own world. Why did no one smile? Excuse me. Nothing I've ever done, and I've done some controversial controversial stories, produce such a reaction. 
Were they drug addicts? Were they in a concentration camp, an asylum? Many magazines and newspaper articles later, still no one knew. For me, it was just a problem of fitting five girls across a double page spread. An affect or a mood took over and shaped the photograph, spilling beyond um, the compositional challenge of, of fitting five women um, into, the, into the space, tipping into the strange, the dangerous, the unacceptable, and even the uh, taboo. While the series provoked uproar in an interview from 1981, um, Tuberville explained that people saw Auschwitz and lesbians and drugs in the image. I, I, I kind of like that combination. <laughs> it's a it's a compelling one. Not that I like the subject matter of of the, of, of of Auschwitz. Um, uh, Tuberville does not argue that the shock her viewers viewers experienced is an ignorant reaction or a misreading. Um, she hints at her work's affinity with surrealist photography, um, and also says that the photographs acquired a Marquis de Sade feeling, a very telling illusion. Marquis de Sade is, as you probably know, is the French writer of the 18th and early 19th century, infamous for libertine books filled with scenes of sexual debauchery, compulsion, and cruelty that test the edges of reason. Admired by the surrealists, his work became part of their commitment to visualizing the unconscious and challenging cultural, psychic and cultural repression. By attaching feeling to Marquis de Sade's name, Tuberville reminds us that there really only, is only the suggestion of pornographic debauchery or sexual sadism in her photographs. They're not depictions of, of, of it. Um, the fact that the setting is, is an urban bathhouse, an iconic space of gay male sexuality, inflects the scene with the freedom of sexual aggression and anonymity. But these, associ these associations, like the uh, Marquis de Sade illusion, only really hover in the shadowy air as possibilities that the women may or may not uh, take up and pursue. We can see how much uh, Tuberville's photographs are at odds with fashion when we go back to the original appearance in the pages of Vogue. Though the title of the spread is evocative, uh, there's more than the to the bathing suit than meets the the eye, and there's a, a refrain of secrets that runs through the, the copy. It, the writing is cheery and upbeat about products that expand uh, beach dressing beyond the bathing suit. Emphasizing the new, the descriptions are really dis quite disconnected from the images and what feels like their gravitational pull to long, even mythical histories about women. The writing refers to the beach as, that, as if that's the place where the models actually are. And there is little that corresponds to the dark tone of the photographs. No mention of the fact that the models appear in a shadowy, in shadow, in a shadowy abandoned bathhouse with mold and grime on the walls. The photograph from the bathhouse series is the, uh, the, the one I showed here. Um, is the one by which Tuberville is, is really best known. It is an icon of her career and her daring aesthetic. Um, after her death in 2014, this was the image that accompanied the tribute to her work in American Vogue. Uh, designer Vera Wang, who wrote the tribute to Tuberville, um, she was the assistant to Mellon at the time and worked on the shoot. Um, Wang alludes to the enormous uproar to which the photographs gave rise, and she then characterizes the uniqueness of uh, Tuberville's vision and hints at its feminist potential. This is, this is uh, Vera Wang. As a female photographer, uh, Deborah had her own idea, idea and ideal of femininity and sex, sensuality. She came along at a time when nearly all fashion photographers were men. And she was a woman photographing women during an era of tremendous social change. In the 70s and 80s, she brought a completely different spirit and energy to the depiction of women. Her subjects had an interior life. So I'm very interested in the idea of, of women's um, interior life and how the bathhouse photographs evoke it. And the fact that this dimension of Tuberville's work makes it both rare and then connected to tremendous social change. I think it is a significant part of her, of her work's meta, meta reflection on fashion photography because an interior life linked as it is to fantasy, uh, complexity, singularity is precisely what dominant assumptions about femininity, fashion and images deny. 
What if the photograph's evocation of interior lives, its suggestion of women becoming subjects of their own erotic complexity is really what's at, what's at stake in the, in the negative response to these images? In the documentary In Vogue, the editor's eye, Mellon fleshes out the details of the controversy. She explains that they re received a lot of letters from people expressing how much they disliked the images. And Mellon's own family contributed to the unhappy chorus. According to Mellon, um, her family members thought the images were, quote, unnecessary, unpleasant, and taking advantage of women in a sad situation. This negative response, the trouble, as Mellon describes it, relies, it seems to me, on a reaction to the images and the idea, uh, uh, the, a reaction to the dark tone of the images. And the idea that, that they can only be read as evidence of women's objectification, the idea that they are passive masochistic kind of statistics. And, and therefore the images are not responses to or performances of, of that objectification. So, you know, and this illustrates for me that often when people are sympathetic to women, um, and, and I'm certainly guilty of this, uh, they often flatten their relationships to images, make women and, and objectification one and the same, and therefore skipping over the possibilities of fantasies and interiority that relay between passivity and activity that I talked about at the opening of the opening of the paper. Um, so we can better see the distinction of Tuberville's photographs when we compare them to one of uh, fashion photography's biggest names and a representative of the male dominance of fashion photography that Wang alludes to, Helmut Newton. The bathhouse images appeared in the same issue as um, uh, Baroness, Baroness and Frag's, Fragrance, the story of, of Ooh. I just thought of this. Is this the story? This not the story of O. The story of O. Is, is this an allusion to the infamous and and decidedly sedan novel, the story of O, about a female fashion photographer who submits to a sadomasochistic relationship? I don't know. This I, this just ar arose for me as a question. But at the center of of this spread, um, the story of O. Um, uh, is Newton's well-known image of a white woman sitting comfortably on a couch with open legs. In this photograph, which came to be called Woman Examining Man, um, uh, San Tropez, she wears a smock blouse, provocatively untied, and a matching wrap, wrap skirt. Unabashedly and with great erotic intensity, she gazes at the man without a shirt wearing perfect, pristinely clean white pants. He walks before her and out of the frame. Viewers don't see his face, um, but, Newt, uh, but Newton has captured, I think quite brilliantly, uh, the shadow of, of his profile on the wall. It hovers above the woman's arm with a kind of faint authority. The placement of her arms and hands highlights her sexual confidence. One rests confidently on her hip, the other arm adorned with thick white uh, bracelets, which uh, you know always signify the 70s to me, um, uh, rests on the, the sofa, uh, sofa cushion as the woman absentmindedly pulls at her hair. Newton's work is, you know, far from, from feminist. This is self-portrait with wife and models, Paris 1981. Um, but the photograph of the woman on the couch does reflect the impact of both feminism and, uh, you know, the sexual revolution. Clearly and dramatically, it reverses what the filmmaker and theorist Laura Mulvey identified in 1975 as the male gaze a way of seeing in Hollywood cinema that reinforces the idea that a woman's primary purpose is to create an image of her body that will soothe the anxious male ego. Mulvey, as is well known, utilized psychoanalytic concepts such as voyeurism, scopo scopophilia, and castration to begin explaining how cinema and then visual culture more broadly um, was is, is invested in the display of women's visual beauty and sexual availability, what she calls to be looked atness, um, to codify the image of a woman's body as the site of vulnerability or guilt. Um, um, and this allowed this, this construction of, of women as, as image 
um, uh, Molly argues, allowed masculine identified viewers to internalize the fiction of a dominant masculinity that can wield the male gaze for its sense of coherence and centrality. So Newton's image is not an illustration of the male gaze. The sultry woman on the sofa comfortably embodies uh, its power, flipping its gender hierarchies around, deploying what a female, um, what we might call a female gaze to make a, the fragmented image of a man into the object of her fantasy. Seeing the desire that moves through her eyes, it is clear the woman not only wants to have sex, but looks to be actively thinking about it, right? Um, but the, image uh, the image creates a space of fantasy. And while the other uh, images in, in the spread, I love this, this, this image has such a great sense of humor. Uh, the other images assert the sexual power of women and their capacity for voyeurism. Some even have a kind of staged cartoony quality like this one. Um, there are quite a few images of in, the, in this spread um, that reassert masculine domination through images that evoke possessive holds and lecherous kind of touches. Um, I'm not interested in making Newton the bad guy here, um, but I do think we can learn a lot about Tuberville's work by reading her work alongside, alongside his. When placed in relationship to his portrayal of the female gaze, we see that tu Tuberville's bathhouse photographs um, have a subtler engagement with feminism. They exhibit a passive resistance to objectification, but also hesitate before taking up the visual language of sexual power written by masculine dominance. In other words, the bathhouse photographs do not take the male gaze on its own terms, but might perhaps begin to imagine different possibilities for power and looking. Other images in the bathhouse series develop the ominous eroticism of the photograph that I began with and underscore Tuberville's talent for arranging groups of women in space in such a way to evoke complex and collective intimacy. They also reveal her interest in dance. And when looking at Tuberville's photographs, I've often thought about uh, Ed Edgar Degas' uh, portrayals of ballerinas and the visual blur of their entwined bodies. Um, this one that I'm showing here by Tuberville is not quite as eerie as the first one, um, uh, but it echo it does echo the the the, uh, the one I discussed. The central figure is is performing a kind of plie it, uh, at this, and it, she is the center around which the rest of the composition um, spins. The black model is again. Um, uh, revealing her backside and turns to make uh, direct eye contact with the camera. All of the women are sculpting themselves into kind of alienated, you know, images of, of their bodies. Um, this photograph evokes ballerinas at the, at the bar and their upraised arms, uh, the upraised arms of the three women draw attention to the pattern in which it, their, um, the images of their bodies appear almost as though they're in a kind of freeze. It is particularly the woman in the foreground of the image wearing a two-piece bathing suit that emblematizes the performative dimension of the, this photograph. It is as if she's playing with the ecstatic image of her, the, the ecstatic image her body creates. And this play draws attention to the almost, this almost brittle kind of um, theatrical feeling. Um, there is one photograph, this one in the bathhouse series that makes sexuality more than a mood. Um, but even with the woman on the floor who submissively brings her mouth to the out outstretched arms of the young man, physical touch really has yet to take place. Perhaps the space between the hand uh, and the mouth is the space for viewers to imaginatively enter the photograph with their, with their fantasies. Um, Portraying um, women together is a consistent theme in Tuberville's work. This is an image taken in, um, in Normandy in 1977. This uh, this is much later, uh, Valentino Couture from uh, 2011. Um, this this theme of, of of women together or women on women, as one series is 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 titled, is one she returned to throughout her career. It is important as her devotion to abandoned spaces or her kind of commitment to the beauty of flaws and imperfections. To my mind, these images together evoke the complexity of women's collective intimacy. They are erotically together, um, but as I've tried to stress also separate, 
opening spaces for a homosocial rewriting of femininity and challenging the idea that it is, as Sharon Marcus puts it, heterosexuality and nothing but heterosexuality. Many of uh, Tuberville's images of women together enact a process of becoming images. And these are uh, from the Dummy series from 1974. Um, um, and, and I find these uh, uh, very compelling um, as, as kind of, again, commentaries on, on becoming images. Um, the homosocial uh, collectivity of these portrayals show us the project of expanding our perception of women beyond the deeply entrenched assumption that they are passive masochistic statistics is one that requires collectivity, but uh, but this collectivity really also demands space for women's differences. So I'll end it there um, and and thank you for your attention. I look forward to your to, to your question. Thanks so much. That was so fascinating. Um, does anybody have any questions? Nothing came through during the presentation, but um, if not, I'll just begin then. Um, sure. In terms of uh, what you've seen in terms of uh, fashion photography now and how femininity is portrayed, mm -hmm. you see close lineages to people who may be citing uh, Turbeville as an influence, but maybe unknowingly, or mm. really interesting about the way she also began her career at career editing. And right. So about that and how it's informed, particularly in Italian Vogue, I think. Mm -hmm. How that's informed certain notions about femininity, femininity that might be also um, culturally specific or geographically specific. Hmm. Uh, well, first, the image of, of uh, photographers taking up um, Tuberville's work, even unlo unknowingly. I love the unknowingly part. I think that I, I think that's really fascinating. And of course, Francesca Woodman comes to mind. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know if Woodman knew about Tuberville's work, but there. But again, it's the unknowing part that's interesting. Um, and there's there's definitely echoes of, of that work and certainly a, a kind of erotic complex. Uh, complexity. Um, and then, um, and I'd love to know more about photographers working now that maybe you see as kind of alluding to Tuberville's work or engage with Tuberville's work. Um, it, and it is, if that's part of kind of the, the framing of the exhibition, I'd love to know more about that. Um, in terms of editing um, and, and that as a kind of beginning, I think that's um, I think that's really quite fascinating and contributes to the um, certainly the collage dimension of the work, which is uh, so crucial to the um, to the exhibition. And the fact that she it seems as though she took that early work of editing and made it into something that um, challenges the uh, the kind of clean lines that we expect of of, of magazine uh, photography, uh, fashion photography, uh, I think is quite fascinating as well. And then um, I do think that um, it editing um, kind of behind the scenes um, is probably um, alludes to a kind of um, a long history of working of women working behind the scenes and sort of making the images. So I'm interested in this kind of like polarization of women kind of in the spotlight of the of the of the image, their bodies on display, and then also invisible behind the scenes, um, editing images or you know uh, in, in the work of making film, working on costumes, et cetera, et cetera, um, coloring images, um, doing all that work that's invisible. But and of course, you know the the, the figure who kind of moves between those that the uh, hi, you know hyper visibility and then invisibility is the director or the, the photographer who has traditionally been um, aligned with men or available to men. So yeah, I think on that point, um, you see that where budget allows for there to be movement direction that uh, into that element that you're suggesting in the latter point. Um, to the earlier one that you made about Francesca Woodman. 
Mm -hmm. At the moment, people are, um, like the blind man organizations, are trying to find more concrete links between how woodmen may have connected to Turbeville's yeah. influence. Um, but I think that's still something that people are um, researching. So that's not necessarily as concrete. I know that through this show, there's the hope of making um, these tenuous links more um, more specific and direct. Right. Um, and I think for me, in terms of her influence, I don't know if I think about it. There are some stylists whose name I'm forgetting right now where I think mm -hmm. that there is some kind of link to that hyperfeminization. I can see it in some fashion designers, um, mm -hmm. thinking specifically like in London, Simone Rocha, I think mm -hmm. into that hyperfemininity. Mm -hmm. oh, when I was talking about it with one of the curators for the show, I was also mm -hmm. interested in. Um, but they were also interested in uh, Roxana, Roxana's work and rethinking the feminine form and how compositional it is and how it's uh. similar to Simone, which leans into like really phallic type. Uh, right. Um, Roxana also reshaped silhouette too and a very feminine, but also Roxana kind of conceals as much as she reveals. Mm -hmm. but, yeah um right but it is interesting to think about that in terms of it like how these shapes um how the photography would have influenced so many different aspects of how photog um how fashion has turned into its business now yeah there's some questions that come in sure so from nicolette uh nicolette asking um do you think there's a factor of time being at play in this moment in the reintroduction of her photographs? Mm. Um, in other words, uh, 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 what is it about this moment in time that makes it kind of right to revisit her, uh, be revisiting her work? Well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really um, great question. I don't know. Um, well, uh, um, I think you know uh, the, you know I'm 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 in the states and and Louise and I were um, speaking um, before the talk started about the election and um, the situation we're here in the states that will be kind of consequential for the world and we are seeing you know we have seen in recent years a kind of reassertion of a, a kind of a patriarchal masculinity and how much women's presence on the global stage is a threat to that. I mean, I, you know, I'm, we're, you know, we're seeing that so clearly. So um, I, I think, you know, work like Tuberville that is unabashed about the aesthetic value of femininity and practices like photography and fashion, I think, um, um, just uh, you know, just just reinforce um, the you know how multifaceted um, our understanding of feminism can be. But you know, it can be one of you know resistance and and women becoming um, presidents and leaders, and it can it can also be about um, these kind of uh, reflections, these you know homoerotic reflections on women's sexuality and stuff like that. So I, I I'd like to think of of the return to her work and the appreciation of, appreciation of her work right now as being part of a, maybe a, a commentary on um, how how valuable and multifaceted feminine it, uh, fem, feminism is and what it, what it can be, what it can continue to be. I think from the gallery's viewpoint, mm -hmm. um, there is interest, I think, in trying to revisit figures such as Turbeville who may have been um, under-recognized until right. now, and really trying to cement these stories um, or the, these stories and histories that are not fixed. Um, right. So, I mean, that's always what we endeavor to do with people who maybe have, may have been under-recognized which is the case also with um, Battaglia, who did have recognition, Vrela Tipsy Battaglia, who's also who's with the show that we have alongside Turbeville. Um, mm -hmm. some recognition in this still a lot, but um, uh, anyway. Um, yeah. 
so I'll leave it we're hoping to do. Um, and I think it is also really important for us to have a moment where we're having to um, atypical photographers um, who are not male shown at the gallery simultaneously. So hopefully- we'll Right. That's I think that's the great. Um, there's another question from Badisha, um, which we touched on a little bit just now in her yeah. comments, but um, asking about how Turbeville's work was regarded during her career. Um, was she was she seen just as a fashion photographer or as an artist? Um, my understanding is that she, um, you know, was highly regarded as a fashion photographer, but definitely moved into kind of artistic realms and had um, exhibitions. Um, um, not just as a fashion photographer, but um, but as, as an artist, and um, um, had you know a, a whole books commissioned and devoted to her work. And um, there is you know there is an ex really strong and expansive body of of um, of her of her of her photographs. That's as much as I know about how much her work, how well her work has been regarded um, in its in its time. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, I think part of what of Louise is getting at is kind of maybe like concentric circles of sort of um, impact and uh, and influence and name recognition. Cer she certainly doesn't have the name recognition, as far as I know, of Helmut Newton or Abaddon, something like that. And so I think that's part of the um, uh, the kind of recu recuperative dimension of of this exhibition that can be really valuable. Yeah, but she was really influential. I mean, particularly yeah. maybe in a problematic way, but thinking about um, female figures in the '90s, um, again with acknowledgement of the problems that they oh, oh, they presented. But um, that waif figure that became really popular. Yeah. Again, acknowledging the problems that that that, <laughs> on that kind yeah. of glamorization of that body type. But, right. Um, so there are these links that are just not necessarily attributed directly to her but she, but she did have really strong under, undercurrents right and that famous uh um fashion editor for italian vogue um franca susani yeah susani yeah yeah um, hugely influenced by yeah um by Turkville. i love that have you seen the documentary on susani <laughs> Yeah, it's great. And, and Tuberville's there it, and she's in the, you know, she's in the, um, she's there and she's talking about um, uh, what, what Susani dared to do. And, and so it, um, it's, it, it's really great to kind of see her there and hear her voice and hear how much she appreciated what the editor of Italian Vogue was doing. But I have to say, like in that, in that documentary, for the most part, it's about Susani's relationship to male photographers, right? So Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's probably an element to where um, her son is um, yeah. interested in that relationship because he himself is a photographer and filmmaker. Right. Produced that film. But, right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, that's so common, though, to look at these very strong non-male characters, um, non-male figures, and their relationship to um, to men. Yeah. Because we want, because we want to encourage um, men to love and appreciate women, and and you know that's all you know that's all great. But uh, but what I like about uh, Tuberville's work is that it shows a kind of, again a kind of homoerotic possibility among yeah. women. Yeah, no, I think that's certainly something um, which we have, which is becoming more prominent now. There is actually a question just thinking about it in terms of um, that relationship to men. And I wonder if you would consider, Kimberly, um, how these images might have been interpreted had the photographer been male. Um, oh. But I think those comparisons well, that you made to Helmut Newton kind of show like maybe an over-sexualization. Yeah, I mean, um... I mean, it it, it kind of depends. Like, how much do people pay attention to the name of the photographer that's in the fashion spread, right? I mean, how much are they um, kind of uh, attending to that? So that's you know that that's one thing. I do think it 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 it, it, it 
it could make a difference, but it, co it could also not make a difference because I think the, um, I think then as in now, although, you know, less so, I think we're pretty saturated in the male gaze and the idea of, of objectifying women. So there may be a way in which people were more, if they knew that the photographs were uh, created by a woman photographer, and I need to know, you know, I need to know, more, learn more about this, um, they may even be more appalled by, by them, right? Um, so, uh, that's that's not a, a a clear answer that had like four answers to it, but I think it's a it's a good question, um, and one that raises a lot of issues about identification and uh, what we um, allow men and women um, to depict through their eyes and and what we allow them to see. So by identification, do you mean like the positionality of the photographer? Yes, yes. Um, so who they are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I think in this community, people do focus and are interested in who the photographers are, but you're right. Yeah, of course. Credit lines and thinking about, you know, the artistic direction. Um, there's an interesting, <laughs> sorry, this is on Disney+. Plus. There's an interesting uh, docu-series looking at fashion in the 90s. Um, uh, uh -huh. in relation to Vogue um, and it looks at it from like a very thematic view like hip-hop culture and black uh, for instance but um, mm -hmm. it's on like some of the models um, some of the photographers but I think some of the photographers actually in that time have proven to be problematic and were problematic then it just wasn't reported um, but it's sort of interesting I got thinking about the industry as a whole mm -hmm. um, there are a couple more questions coming through. We have a few more minutes, so if anyone else has any questions or comments, um, if you do want to pose your question directly, feel free to just um, raise your hand. There's a function here on Zoom that allows you to do that. Otherwise, just keep sending them through in the chat function. Um, there's a question here about kind of what you touched on about commissioning here and who may be brought to your bill in. So they're wondering about is there any information about who commissioned Turbeville's work um, and who the other editors were at the time? And um, they're curious about, uh, I think maybe this person, I'm not sure, Imogen, if you're asking about the person in Italian Vogue, but uh, Imogen also asks um, or says that they're curious whether the person at the helm of Vogue had a similar experimental vision or was that, or was perhaps a contemporary of Turbeville. So maybe you're talking about Susani? Or Lieberman? Pardon? Or Lieberman? Yeah. Um. Or Mellon? Um, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that, um, well, first of all, um, um, to, uh, from what I understand that Tuberville's meeting Diana Vreeland um, was pretty crucial um, to, um, uh, and uh, as far as I understand, and, and, and I mean, Vreeland, um, Vreeland, Lieberman, um, Mellon, these figures, I think, you know, I mean, with this kind of a renaissance moment in fashion photography um, in, in this, in the seventies and um, they took risks. I think, you know, that they, I, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, whether, you know, these photographs, if they were produced now, um, you know, would they have this, you know, would they spark the same kind of outrage? Probably not. Um, probably not. But if there was something equivalent to um, 2024, um, would Tuberville have been sort of kept on? In other words, I'm thinking about kind of cancel culture and stuff. So that isn't, I'm, I'm getting away from, from the question. But I, my understanding is that there was this kind of infrastructure um, that supported the creative imagination and um, Lieberman, um, it, it's clear Lieberman as, as a kind of, um, as an exile from Europe, um, and had a vision, a kind of expansive vision, um, same with uh, of, of Reland as well, that um, encouraged these kinds of risk-taking that actually um, really spilled beyond fashion's uh, uh, kind of primary purpose of, of selling clothes. Is there anyone you look to now who you think has the same kind of experimental vision? I mean, fashion and 
publishing is obviously I think not as um, challenge it's not a challenge as like the rest of um, the industry. Yeah. I see in terms of um I um not photographers but it's, it's designers although they're very active with their, their creating their own images I do see a real affinity with uh, uh between Tuberville's work and Rodarte's work like the just the unabashed oh uh, yeah of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um attention to to femininity the you know the bows and the layers and the kind of over the top um even I mean Tuberville's doesn't quite move into the tacky but um uh, Brodarte does but um really pushing um against the sexism that can emerge um through taste right and the idea that um you know, too much femininity in an image or a dress or something like that is just something that we should probably kind of recoil from. And if, if we don't, then there's something wrong with us or something. So I see Rajarte really um, uh, pushing those boundaries. And I think Tuberville was a, a, a pioneer, for lack of a better word, in, in, that, in that project. Yeah, they're really skilled at um, not getting to the point where it's too saccharine. You know, yes. Think about like Simone Rocha as well, because for like Rodarte and Simone Rocha, they're so supported by craft and skill that right. they could stand apart. Um, for me, I was thinking like when I was doing research for uh, the programming around this, uh -huh. looking at magazines um, uh, like Luna, no, Violet, mm. sorry, Violet. And do you remember Luna before? No. I don't know it, but pilot um, and gentlewoman to a degree. Mm. Gentlewoman has a different, um, a different kind of aesthetic when it comes to femininity, but it also leans into embracing it as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, That's great. I'll have to look at look up those. And the work of, in terms of styling of um, oh my gosh, what's her name? Lee. Clark. Hmm. Uh, she works actually pretty often with um Rodarte as well. Oh, okay. But I've always been really interested in the way that they uh, really embrace the femininity. Um, there's a kind of virgin suicides aesthetic to it as well. Yeah, so, absolutely, which, absolutely. Which I love. I mean, that would be something that I would. I you know I think of like Degas dancers and but. But um, the virgin suicide, for sure. I mean, particularly the the languorous poses, the the you know the entwined bodies, the playing with the i you know playing with and against the idea that you know all women are you know sort of just the the same. You know, I think that that's uh, that's kind of what's at at work in some of these images. So yeah, the virgin suicides for sure. Yeah, and I think um, which is key in Turbeville's too is. Um... In the virgin suicides is that there is an innocence but there's also like an adulthood a, a maturation of the female figure yeah um not there's agency there yes yeah absolutely um, absolutely sorry imogen's clarifying point uh so when imogen was asking about the photographs of Turbeville's work for vogue um, Imogen was specifically citing the work from American Vogue in the 1975 photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for making that clarification. Uh, does anybody else have any final questions before we wrap up this evening? I'm going to pause and see if anything comes through because I tend to talk over these pauses out of discomfort. We'll cross your fingers for us here in the United States. <laughs> no, oh my gosh, less than a week out. We will be awake with you. Yeah. Um, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for being being here. Thanks for the questions and and thanks for the conversation. Um, uh, I've really gotten a lot out of it, and I've 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 learned a lot. The 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 magazines. Uh, uh, did you say there were magazines? Luna and Gentlewoman. Is that right? Gentlewoman. Um, Violet. Violet's actually. If it is Violet, I'm thinking correctly. Um, Lise Clark, Lise Clark, the stylist I mentioned, she founded that. But it reminds mm. me of um, well, it doesn't really remind me, but it just makes me think of um, 
remember that that publication from the U.S. Jane. Yes. Um, yes. So those kind of things, and like Sassy and Mademoiselle. Mm -hmm. um, there's just something about like these gaps in the markets, and you know, as a child of the '80s and '90s, mm -hmm. thinking about how critical it was when you didn't see people around you immediately, in like whatever town you grew up in, you had these magazines who helped, you know, spur your interests or validate it. Um, right. So important. Right. And it makes me think of Tuberville's, you know, like she had a, she created a book, Passport and Wallflower. So she really brought her, her, her skills as, as a magazine editor kind of, um, and her, and her work as a photographer together to sort of like create books and create publications that, that, um, aren't, um, were distributed widely, obviously, but, um, but have, you know, evoked that, that potential of kind of finding finding a publication where you might be able to see your own complexity in. Yeah, and there is complexity in, in the whimsical and there's substance in it. Yeah, right. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, and spending some time with us. Hopefully if you're in London, you'll have a chance to see the Deborah Turville show. And as I mentioned, um, Kimberly has some books coming out. Um, the ones in, put in your biography, but also the contribution to the anthology where you're writing on Turboville as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. And thank you for being here. Soon, I'm going to plug another event that we have. We have a course starting on the 11th of November um, that's looking at different feminist perspectives in photography, taking inspiration from Turboville, but also um, Vitalia, as I mentioned, the other show that's showing alongside Turboville at the Photographer's Gallery. So it's um, just thinking through some of the intersections where femininity, feminism, cross over into race, unpacking some of these theories, thinking about transness, um, mm. what these um, works kind of show us about the agency of non-male narrative voices. So hopefully um, you, some of you may join us for that. It's online as well. So please keep checking our What's On page for more information. We have a conference coming up in the new year so keep your eyes out for that and that's related to Turberville's work as well uh thank you so much kimberly that was such a fascinating yeah discussion. thank you and thank you everyone here for your questions and your comments again thank you for spending some time with us and uh take care everyone see you soon bye bye